Thanks for tuning in. Ham Talk Live will be on the air shortly. Please stand by. This episode of Ham Talk Live is brought to you by Tower Electronics. For connectors, cables, and more, call 920-435-2973 or visit pl-259.com. And by ICOM. Heard it? Worked it? Logged it. Visit www.icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information about ICOM radios. It's Ham Radio. Good evening, everyone. It's time for Ham Talk Live, episode number 214. Collecting solar power from space, recorded live on Thursday, May 28th, 2020. I'm your host, Neil Rapp, WB9VPG. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Ham Talk Live. Tonight, we're joined by Dr. Paul Jaffe, KJ4IKI, and we'll take your calls live in just a few minutes. Last week, Christian Kudnick, K0STH, was here to talk about the tune-up event. And if you missed that show, you can listen anytime at hamtalklive.com or on your favorite podcast app or on YouTube. And you can catch the rebroadcast on WTWW, that's 5085 AM Saturdays, but there's a new time. Uh, they changed the time last week. Uh, we're on about 3.30 PM Eastern time over on WTWW. Again, that's Saturdays, 5085 AM, and we're on about 3.30 in the afternoon now instead of... Uh, I think it was 6.30 we were on, so um, note that uh, schedule change there. Uh, A couple of notes here before we get going. Um, First of all, AWRL uh, released some changes to the field day rules today. Um, Class D operators are able to talk to other Class D operators because there's going to be probably a bunch of Class D operators that's operating from home. Uh, this year. So that's a, a temporary rule change and also uh, a club category where you can kind of compile people that are in a club. So check up on that. And again, we'll have our field day Q&A uh, show here in a couple of weeks. And uh, Paul Bork um, in one SFQ will be here um, to give us the latest on everything on field day. But just wanted to mention that if you haven't seen that, uh, that came out today. So take a look at that. Also, we had some people asking for ham talk live shirts. We haven't done an order in a long time and I didn't make one for Dayton this year since hamvention didn't happen. So, um, I went ahead and opened up the uh, shirt order form again. So if you're interested in buying a ham talk live shirt, those are, uh, those orders will go through June 15th and, uh, then I'll take the orders and, and send that order in and get those made and get those mailed out. Um, so if you're interested in getting a ham talk live shirt, uh, the, they're $20 for most sizes and that includes shipping and everything. Um, just go to our website, hamtalklive.com, and there's a link there where you find the show schedule, and then it also says uh, shirt order. And at the top of the schedule page, there's a, a link to the shirt order. Uh, I also posted on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, so uh, you can go there and just click on the link, and it'll take you to the uh, to the order form if you're interested in getting one of those since uh, since we haven't done one in a while. Okay, well, the thunder rolls outside. I don't know if you can hear that or not, but uh, hopefully uh, we'll be able to get through without any interruptions tonight. Um, we've got a great guest tonight. Um, Dr. Paul Jaffe is uh, 
working on some really cool stuff and we're really excited to talk to him so get your questions ready to go for him if you're listening to us live on thursday night you can give us a call after the interview by telephone at 859-982-7373 you can also send a question via twitter the twitter handle is at ham talk live and i'll give out that phone number again uh, in just a little bit and also when we get to the time where where you can call in um, again it's 859 982 7373 so have that handy and i'll let you know when it's time to call in so i'll be back with paul right after this word from tower electronics right here on ham talk live thanks for choosing tower electronics how may we help you today we have pl259s we have in connectors we have sma adapters we have vnc adapters what can i show you today where's the tower Well, we don't actually have a tower with us, but we have all kinds of things you can use with a tower. We have power poles, antennas, soldering irons and meters. Where's the tower? (laughs) Ma'am, that's the name of our company. We can't haul towers to all the ham fests across the country that we visit, but we have almost every connector and adapter you would need to connect your antenna that's on your tower. I don't think there's a tower back there. I really don't. Tower Electronics. Visit us at a ham fest near you or call 920-435-2973 or see our whole catalog at pl-259.com. Sorry, one thing we don't have is a tower. It's not the amount of power, it's the size of our tower. Ham Talk Live. Thanks to Tower Electronics for sponsoring the show again tonight. Uh, all those ham fests are, are canceled, so you'll have to find them online. But they are there. It's pl-259.com. And they'll be back out on the ham fest trail as soon as we get some of these uh, ham fests opened up. And you can stop by and say hello to Scott and Jill. But for now... Catch them online, pl-259.com. Well, my guest tonight is Dr. Paul Jaffe, KJ4IKI. He's a spacecraft engineer for the United States Naval Research Laboratory in the field of space, solar, and power beaming. Uh, Paul has a Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering from the University of Maryland, a Master's from Johns Hopkins, and a Ph.D. from the University of Maryland. He's worked on over a dozen NASA and Department of Defense space missions. He served as a coordinator and editor of the Naval Research Lab's Space Solar Power Study Report and is the principal investigator uh, for a solar or a space solar power related research effort. So, Paul, thank you so much for taking time out to be on the show tonight. Neil, it's my pleasure. I'm grateful for the opportunity. And, and I should mention that that Paul came to us through another Paul. Uh, Paul Brown, WD9GCO, was interviewing you for Newsline and actually anchored that episode of, of Newsline or that report uh, last week and, and said, I, I had this fabulous interview. This guy is great. He, he, he's got all this cool stuff. And I had to put it all into 90 seconds and and it just doesn't do justice. So, so he said, Hey, why don't you have him on, on your show? And we can spend some more time talking about some, some of this fascinating research. So, so tell us about collecting, uh, solar power in space and, and beaming it back and, and this, uh, satellite that's going to give you some data to, to try some of this stuff and gather some data, uh, for further development. Yeah. So it's, and it's a very exciting time for us because we recently had a space experiment launch. This was, uh, recently on the X 37B, which is the air forces space plane. 
sort of like a mini space shuttle, but uh, launches, and since it has no people on it, it can stay up there for quite some time. And we were fortunate to get a hosting opportunity on that craft and launch recently. We're still awaiting the data, but it should be up there for a good long time, at least uh, some number of months, maybe even a couple of years. And we should be able to get information that will help us advance the technology. It probably makes sense for me to step back a little bit and just talk about what space solar is and what the motivation for it is. The idea actually dates back quite some time, depending on which uh, historical references you trust. Uh, It could be Isaac Asimov back in 1941, who wrote about it in a short story called Reason that appeared in the iRobot collection that some of your listeners might be familiar with. And then there was a noteworthy article in the journal Science in 1968, authored by Peter Glazer. But the main idea is that you are collecting sunlight in space and then sending it wirelessly to the earth and you might reasonably ask well the sunlight hits the earth even if you don't have a satellite in space why would you add this extra step and the reasoning goes along these lines on the earth of course we have nighttime which uh averaged over the course of the year means half the time you're not getting sunlight and then with clouds and weather and the atmosphere the amount of sunlight that you have access to is further reduced. Depending on the orbit you select in space, you can be in sunlight greater than 99% of the time, and you never have to worry about clouds or weather losses, and the sunlight is going to be brighter there than anywhere on Earth. So the trick then is figuring out an economical way or a way that makes sense for whatever your particular application is to collect that sunlight and then to send it to the place where you need it on Earth. In the ideal situation, you could think of space solar as having the benefits of being clean, because like ground-based solar, there's no carbon dioxide that's produced. It is constant, unlike solar on the ground. And something that's unique about it compared to any other energy source is that it can be transmitted globally. So you could think of this maybe in the same terms that you would think about GPS or another satellite constellation that provides global service, the idea that you could get energy anywhere in the world. And then, of course, the sun is the closest thing we have in our solar system to an unlimited energy source. It's a fusion reactor we can already take advantage of. So that's kind of the basic lay of the land for what it is and what the motivation comes from. So what kind of data do you get from for the satellite how are you, what kind of data are you gathering and how how do you use that to try to test some of the theories and and making this all work so i should mention pretty early on here that there's a lot of different ways that solar power satellites could be implemented There was a sort of heyday in the 1970s during the first energy crisis in which NASA and the Department of Energy worked together and spent quite a bit of money on studies and some early technology demonstrations to look at how this could be done. And, of course, the energy crisis at that time dissipated and interest waned and people said, oh, you know, my gas is less than a dollar a gallon again. Why am I going to worry about energy? Fast forward a couple decades and we still have to worry about energy for some of the same reasons and for some new reasons, too. And certainly, though most of our energy still does come from fossil fuels, there's, of course, debate as to exactly when they might run out. But I think it's fairly uncontroversial to say that they will run out at some point. So because there's these different ways that solar power satellites could be implemented, the type of technology that might be used varies a lot. The experiment that we launched recently and that we're going to get the data from pertains to a particular concept called the sandwich approach. And this is a concept in which the sunlight is collected using solar cells. And there are, of course, alternatives. You could use some sort of heat engine or even something exotic like a sun-pumped laser. 
But for the sandwich approach, you use photovoltaics and you use microwave power transmission, which is going to be very familiar to hams. So even within this category of solar power satellites that use photovoltaics for solar collection and microwave power transmission for wireless power transmission, there's still a huge range of different approaches. The experiment that we have on the X37B takes the photovoltaics has the conversion electronics as a layer under the photovoltaics, and then finally has a bottom layer that is the actual transmit antenna element. So what it does is it uses a large phased array as the transmit antenna, and then sort of the top surface of that is covered with the photovoltaics. And then there's a separate part of the satellite that redirects the sunlight using large reflectors to track the sun as it goes to the orbit. So the this is a introduction or a uh, background to the, your question about what data we're going to get and how we're going to use it. The experiment we have on the X-37 does not actually transmit any energy into space. What it does instead is the energy that's generated is transmitted or transferred, really, into a, an electronic load so that we can very accurately measure the output and we can measure then in turn the efficiency of the module and we can also keep track of its temperature performance. Many of your listeners might know that temperature control in space is a lot more difficult than it is on the Earth because we lose one of the three common ways that we use for moving heat around. Uh, for folks who recall their high school science classes, they might know that we move heat through radiation, conduction, and convection. Convection requires some sort of working fluid, which on the Earth can be air. In space, there's no air, of course, so we are limited to conduction for moving heat around a spacecraft and then radiation for getting it into space. If you have a large spacecraft and a large solar array and it's not going to be 100% efficient, there's going to be a lot of heat that needs to be dissipated. And the DC to RF conversion electronics under the solar array is also going to generate waste heat. So a big focus of the experiment is seeing whether we have been successful in our design for controlling the heat. So the main things to summarize are measuring the efficiency of the sunlight to microwave conversion aspect of this module, and then also measuring the thermal performance. Okay, very good. That, that makes makes total sense and, and if if they're listening to this show and they they know what i do for a living they they better remember their high school science so <laughs> <laughs> so now now once you once you work out this the, the collection you've got you've got the the satellite to to work on the collection and and i'm sure there's a whole series of things that are going to have to to take place to get to this point but once you do get it transferred into RF and you and you beam the RF down, then how? What are you going to do with it then? Once you yeah, get it back down here as RF. Important question. The receiver is comprised of a series of what are called rectennas. Rectenna is a portmanteau or a combination of the words rectifier and antenna, and it's a special kind of antenna. And it can take a, a variety of forms, dipoles or uh, a whole range of different forms, depending on the polarization and particular goals, the energy density you expect to fall on it. But basically, it takes the microwave and converts it back to DC on the ground. To help illustrate this, and this is something that I suspect a lot of hams are familiar with, because this idea is not new. Like The idea of a rectenna has been around since at least the 60s. And even if you look at, like, radio electronics or, or any of the old electronics magazines, they would often have different articles about how you could make your own microwave detector or microwave leakage detector. But it basically depends on having a, a shot key diode and a matching circuit that matches the impedance so that you get the maximum energy up. To help folks understand this, because this is uh, this may be common knowledge among hams, but certainly in the general public less so. Earlier this year, we actually had astronaut Jessica Muir on the space station do a demonstration of a rectenna 
you can make a very simple one just by taking a Schottky diode and an LED and putting them together anode to cathode and cathode to anode. And it will light up in the presence of Wi-Fi or even the very small amount of leakage that's common from your kitchen microwave oven. So on the space station, Jessica Muir took one that we had built and sent up on one of the space station resupply missions and showed how she could light up this LED just using the Wi-Fi on the International Space Station. So it's a, a simple demonstration that pretty much anyone can do at home to show how the receiver works, the elements in the receiver. Very cool. So, so you mentioned in, in some of your stuff, uh, about how ham radio has really helped with this research and filled in some of the, um, wave mechanics and things like that. Uh, tell us a little bit about the connection to ham radio. Yeah, absolutely. So I've had my ham license now for about 11 years. I guess maybe a little bit longer. Uh, I got it before my first son was born, anticipating that once I became a parent, I was going to have a lot less time for things, which turned out to be accurate. <laughs> um, and I know in getting ready to take the ham licensing exams, and I was a technician class and then immediately general uh and I was certainly helped by the fact that I had, a, at the time, a education in electrical engineering. There is quite a bit of crossover, as many of your, your listeners might know. Um, so thinking about both in practice and sort of the theory from my educational background together helps a lot, right? Like there's been, I think, a, a loss in some ways of that sort of hands-on and intuitive knowledge that comes with being a ham right we're seeing a little bit of a resurgence with the whole maker movement and the like and uh, it's really reassuring to me that the ham community i think is is responding in a way that makes sense like some of your listeners might might uh, be able to, to understand the context here so uh, you know um, arl now has or has uh, on the air in addition to qst and i get the on the air not just because it's helpful for me, but also because I'm hoping to get my kids into it. And definitely my sons have expressed interest in ham radio. And I got, uh, I forget which company it was now that put out like a comic book some time ago, uh, talking about the different aspects and facets of, of ham radio. But I sort of surreptitiously printed that out and let it hang out around the house. Um, but yeah, but, but certainly just thinking about frequencies and spectrum and wavelength and modulation schemes and understanding the ionosphere and how different parts of the spectrum are more or less conducive to how radio waves and microwaves are going to travel has definitely been helpful to me. So there's, I think, a lot of crossover. And I think that Anyone who has an electrical engineering degree is doing themselves a disservice by not also getting a ham license because it's not that much extra to learn, and it opens up the whole world of ham radio. So there's, a, I think, a missed opportunity a lot of the time. I, I talk to a lot of my electrical engineering colleagues, and it's like, I don't understand why you don't have a ham license. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, well, there you go. There, there's your advertisement for getting your ham license. Well, um, you know, obviously you're, you're hoping that this is going to turn into something. What, 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 what are your hopes for the next few years in, in this project? So there's a, there's a mix of different answers for that. One thing that often folks ask is why is the navy doing this or and there's i guess also the question what does the navy do in space and the answer to that really is like most of the earth's surface is covered by water and one of the best ways to use that for communications or for uh, observation or what have you is is from space you know in a lot of our recent conflicts one of the biggest challenges has been getting energy to places like forward operating bases and combat outposts. We've unfortunately lost a lot of people and, and endured a lot of casualties for things like bringing trucks full of fuel to places that are 
dangerous and hostile. If there was a way to send the energy directly from space to such places, that would be truly game-changing. And taking it even to a, a larger scale, like you can imagine how the developing world, which has a ever-increasing thirst for energy, is going to need to have electricity supplied in some way. And if there's a country or a company that's able to supply that, from space, even without any existing infrastructure, it's a really powerful prospect. Now, we have to be realistic. The fact is that this technology is still maturing. That includes both the power beaming technology and a lot of aspects of the space systems. For a lot of the historically notable concepts, a ton of mass is required to be put in space, right? So we're to, to make the power beaming efficient, particularly for microwave, you need very large apertures, and that translates into a lot of mass for a spacecraft. And the economics, like in so many parts of our world, are really what drive things in the end. DOD is a little bit different because we're not paying 10 cents a kilowatt hour for electricity for our, our soldiers, sailors, and marines that are forward-based. Uh, in some situations, we're paying in excess of $10 a kilowatt hour, depending on how hard it was to get the fuel to power the generator there. They call this the fully burdened cost of fuel. So you can understand why the Navy and why DOD would be interested in this. And you can see how as the technology matures, it may become something that is valuable and compelling for other folks to supply energy in other contexts. And just from like a geopolitical standpoint, you can envision how if there is this capability, it's something that we would probably want the United States to be at the forefront or not too far behind on, right? One example that I often use, or an analogy more accurately, is to GPS, right? I mentioned it briefly earlier, but if we were in 1960 and I told you at that time, like, hey, you know, wouldn't it be great if we could have a constellation of dozens of satellites and you could just have a little handheld device and no matter where you were in the world, it could tell you exactly where you were. You would look at me like I was crazy because at that time we had a handful of satellites and getting into space was still chancy at best, right? You probably have seen uh, videos of all the uh, rocket explosions from that era and atomic clocks, which are central to GPS's function took up several rooms. So the idea of putting something like that on a satellite was completely preposterous, right? We were lucky to be able to put up something the size of a grape grapefruit, much less something that took up several rooms and required very precise temperature control and the like. So, but over time, the technology for miniaturizing and making space where the atomic clocks was developed actually at the Naval Research Laboratory where, where I work. And the system for GPS was put incrementally in place. The technology was developed. And now we take GPS for granted. It's like a utility we don't have to pay for, right? And it has created all of these opportunities and applications that we could have scarcely envisioned in 1960, right? Can you imagine thinking about Uber or uh, all these other similar services that have been enabled by GPS? Just even conceiving of the, the, the concept in 1960 would have been totally alien. So sure. that's one way that it could progress. And I think that's one thing to keep in mind is like, we're not sure exactly how this could unfold, like what it might open up and what uh, opportunities might be there. If you look at GPS pretty soon afterwards, like the Russians did uh, GLONASS because they saw the value of it. And now pretty much every country in the world doesn't want to be beholden to the U S GPS system, right? We've got the Europeans doing Galileo. The Chinese have Beidou. The Japanese have their own system. Uh, other countries recognize the value of this and want to be able to do it for themselves okay very good well we have uh we've gone on quite a while here so we're going to take a break but uh fascinating information so we'll be back with uh paul and we'll talk more about this and we'll take some of your questions we are uh 
uh, getting a few here online on Twitter and on the uh, comments. But uh, if you want to give us a call, let me give you that number again. Um, it's 859-982-7373. So we'll come back and we'll take your calls and your questions and your tweets uh, with Paul right after this word from ICOM America right here on Ham Talk Live. Get out and be active with ICOM's new IC705 and its optional multifunction backpack. The IC705 is your perfect QRP companion as you have base station features and functionality at the tip of your fingers in a portable package covering HF 6 meters, 2 meters, and 70 centimeters. This compact rig weighs in at 1 kilogram or just over 2 pounds with RF direct sampling for most of the HF band and IF sampling for frequencies above 25 megahertz and a large 4.3 inch color touch screen with live band scope and waterfall. It runs 5 watts with a battery, 10 watts with a power supply. It has sideband, CW, AM, FM, and full D-Star functions, a micro USB connector, Bluetooth, wireless LAN, micro SD card slot, integrated GPS with antenna and GPS logger, and the speaker mic comes standard and supports QRP operations. The perfect accessory for your IC705 is the optional backpack, LC192, with a special compartment for your IC705 and room for accessories for soda activations or just a day in the park. Visit icomamerica.com slash amateur for more information about ICOM radios. Join the conversation. Give us a call at 859-982-7373. Again, the number to call is 859-982-7373. Or if you'd rather type than talk, tweet us at Ham Talk Live. Now, here's Neil Rapp with more Ham Talk Live. Sorry for the delay. Your host, Neil Rapp, is reading a book on anti-gravity, and he just can't put it down. Now, here's more Ham Talk Live. Welcome back to Ham Talk Live. Thanks to ICOM America. For sponsoring the show, check them out at icomamerica.com slash amateur. And check us out on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, Ham Talk Live, on all of those. And we're on the air every Thursday night, 9 p.m. Eastern Time at hamtalklive.com. It's time for your phone calls now. If you have a question for Paul, give us a call at 859 859- 982 7373, or you can tweet us. It's at Ham Talk Live on Twitter. And if you're listening to us on WTWW or the podcast edition, you won't be able to reach us live since uh, it's Thursday night um, and we won't be there. So uh, we'll get back to uh, Paul here in just a second. We do have a, a tweet or two, but uh, Jacob is on the line here. Um, this evening so jacob what's your question for paul yeah my question is what uh what is the uh, methodology he will be using in the uh, design of experiments and what uh how many factors are there involved in his experiments jacob thanks for the question yeah there's quite a lot right so one of the challenges for the idea of space solar is because there are so many different ways that it could be done, there's quite a few options on the technologies to be pursued. I'll mention uh, in terms of power beaming. So yes, so at the end of the day, the satellite has to do two things. It has to collect the energy and it has to send the energy wirelessly to wherever it's needed. So for the experiment on the X-37, we're measuring the conversion efficiency, the temperature performance, and various telemetry points that'll help give us a fuller picture of that. We have also been doing work in power beaming in other parts of the spectrum. Last year, we did a power beaming demonstration using lasers, where we sent hundreds of watts over hundreds of meters. And for any of the previous work that I'm making reference to, if your listeners would like to learn more 
the Naval Research Lab has done a number of press releases on these, and it has a YouTube channel that has videos that show uh, Jessica Muir on the space station doing the Bractena demonstration, and also this laser one that I'm talking about. In terms of different parameters that we are interested in for experiments, there's quite a few. For power beaming alone, we've identified 15 different metrics and figures of merit that we would look at, and they include things like the input power to the transmitter, the output power from the receiver, which you can then use to find the end-to-end efficiency, which is important. For a lot of these things, the mass of either the transmitter or the receiver could be of importance. The volume that they take up, these are all different things that are of interest for a given implementation. Does that sort of get at what you were asking about? Yeah, I mean, 15, this, this, this isn't like a 15 factorial design experiment, is it? Oh, no. The one that we have on in yeah. orbit right now is, is quite straightforward. It's, we're measuring efficiency and temperature performance at like a number of different points. So the, oh, okay. and, and, and we've tested it on the ground. We've done simulations. There's no substitute really for testing something in space because of the illumination and temperature and radiation environments. So we're going to learn, no matter what happens, we are likely to learn a lot. And it's not, it, because it's an engineering experiment rather than uh, one where we're trying to just isolate a single variable like you might do in biology or a, uh, a more, uh, or I should say, a, a less applied science, there's less concern about confounding the results by having a range of variables. But the hardware is fixed, right? We, we can change some of the settings depending on where we are in the, the orbit and the like, but... Uh, but for the most part, we'll be running it in a relatively standard configuration. All right. Thanks, Neil. Great show. Uh, very fascinating topic. Oh, thank you very much. And thank you, Jacob, for calling in. We appreciate it. All right. Bye. Bye-bye. And if you'd like to call in, the number is 859-982-7373. We'll... Uh, Take some more calls here as those come in, 859-982-7373. We've got a tweet that came in from Greg, KM5GT. Let's get to that one. Um, Greg says, a question for Paul, is there a danger of this technology being weaponized? If so, what precautions can be put in place? So, yeah, here's the question all of us scientists never want to hear, but <laughs> <laughs> and yet it comes up with uh, great frequency. Yeah, it actually. So probably the question I get the most out of the gate is, "Is this going to fry birds?" So I think this is sort of a, a different, a different uh, aspect of that. That's kind of yeah. like the the astronaut thing. How do you go to the bathroom? Uh, is, is that that's the question. <laughs> is is this going to fry birds? <laughs> right. Yeah, no, that's, that, this is uh, definitely <laughs> definitely the most common one, I think. Uh, so it gets back to the idea of power density, right? If you go outside on a sunny day, you can do that without fear of bursting into flame. However, if you on that exact same day go outside with a large magnifying glass, or even not that large, uh, and you position it carefully, you can set things on fire, not because you increased the amount of energy but because you focused the energy into a smaller area. And this is power density, amount, watts per square meter, if you will. So for space solar, you can design and implement a system that will be unable to produce a power density that will exceed a given threshold, which you can select guided by the IEEE or ICNRP safety thresholds for microwave power density or for laser power density, or for whatever area of the spectrum that you might choose. And it's worth noting that in the case of radio waves and microwaves, they are much harder to focus, right? Like if you put a magnifying glass next to your Wi-Fi router, you're not going to set anything on fire for a couple reasons. <laughs> um, we but, hope. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was going to say, if you can, you should study carefully what's going on, because you may have yes. some uh, astounding breakthrough. Um, 
But because for microwaves, the wavelength is so much longer than for sunlight, like I used in the example there, uh, it's much more difficult to focus and to get to high levels of power density requires even more stupendously large apertures than we've already been talking about. So the risk of danger or weaponization for microwave is very small. And for laser, it's probably more significant, but it's still remote, I would say, in part because lasers don't go as well through the atmosphere. Like a weapon that you can only use if it's not cloudy is going to be probably of of limited uh, military interest. And there's a a variety of, of big challenges. So there's no doubt that any tool has the capability of being weaponized. I mean, the fork that you use to eat dinner with, you could injure someone with if you used it in an inappropriate way. Uh, But solar power satellites would be extraordinarily difficult to weaponize. And all of the important aspects that might lead you to evaluate whether it could be weaponized are going to be in pretty plain sight. Does that answer that question? Yeah, yeah, I think so. And uh, along the same lines, John W4USF um, says uh, he came in late to the broadcast, but um, is there any concern with uh, somebody hacking into this in outer space and, and hacking into the energy and stealing the energy from other countries or, or other companies? Cybersecurity, I think, pervades all of our systems at this point, whether it's a power plant on the ground or a satellite in space. So attention needs to be paid to it, no doubt. Stealing the energy, I think, is probably less of a concern if you've secured the satellite. Like you could, I suppose, in theory, if you were able to hack into any satellite, you could reposition it or repoint it. Most of the concepts for the power beaming are more complex than that. Uh, Unlike a communication satellite or an observation satellite where you can just kind of repoint it and the signal goes somewhere else, for microwave power transmission and also for a number of the laser implementations, you have a beacon on the ground called a pilot signal that sends that signal up to the spacecraft and the spacecraft uses that pilot signal to actually steer the beam. So, and there, and that is an opportunity for encryption right there. So it would be challenging to spoof. And if the satellite didn't see the, uh, the beacon, the power would, would not be directed to the receiver. So there's no question that like any complex system that uses hardware and software needs to be concerned with cybersecurity, but the cons- the considerations for solar power satellites are no greater, I think, than any other system. Okay, very good. 859-982-7373 is the phone number if you'd like to call in. We have just a few minutes remaining, so uh, if you want to give us a call, it's 859-982-7373, and you need to be doing that now because uh, we're just about out of time here for the show this evening. Uh, my guest uh, is uh, Dr. Paul Jaffe, uh, KJ4IKI, from the um, Naval Research Laboratory. And uh, we're talking a little bit about the, this um, collecting solar power in in space and and beaming it back and you brought up at the beginning of the show isaac asimov and and you know talking about it you know way back um in in some of his novels and and that kind of thing but the thing that that came up that 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 i remembered was i i when I was younger, I played Sim City like crazy, and I don't know if, if any of the listeners played Sim City or not. But whenever you you built your city on this computer game, you had all these different power sources, and so you could pick hydroelectric, and you had coal and gas, and all these different things, and solar, and and you know, as in real life, there are pros and cons to each one, and so you know, some of them are going to pollute more, and some of them are going to be more cost efficient, and and that kind of thing. But but when you got to like the year 3000 or something you you got this big 
this huge satellite dish. It looked like one of those great big, you know, C band dishes back in the day. And it's pointed straight up. And, and, and if something went wrong, it's like, you know, the beam was off a little bit. And, and all of a sudden you burned up this, this part of the city. I mean, I, I know you said you can't, you can't fry birds, but is, is that kind of what we're looking at down the road? Yeah, I, I think the uh, the retrodirective beam control will go a long way to preventing the beam from wandering around the countryside, as my colleague uh, Dick Dickinson likes to put it. But uh, yeah, no, that's definitely a memorable image from Sim City, and I've I've seen. I haven't got to that part of the game myself, but back in the day, uh, but definitely I've seen the screenshots of of what you're talking about, and it is. Uh, I think maybe one source of some of the safety concerns that are raised about this. Yeah, we don't we don't need a movie like the China Syndrome to you know to inspire fear in nuclear power. We don't we don't need that. <laughs> yeah, well, and I, there was I think there was a James Bond film also that had a uh, a beam from space and some of the. Uh, maybe even in Akira, I think there was uh, something like that. So yeah, science fiction of course has to look for uh, points of conflict to introduce and <laughs> you, you can uh, invent them wherever you would like. Yeah, there we go. All right. Well, let me, uh, we're, we're, we're actually a little over time here. So let me check and make sure we've uh, addressed all the questions out there that have been typed in. And we got our phone calls tonight, so that was great. Thank you uh, for calling in, Jacob, and uh, chiming in. And I think we I think we've caught up with all the questions. So, Paul, I'll uh, I'll let you make any final remarks that you'd like, and and then uh, we'll let you get going. Great, yeah. No, like I said, I really appreciate the opportunity. I am glad to speak to an audience of hams because I feel like they get the technology a little bit more and they understand some of the subtleties. We didn't uh, discuss too much about spectrum, which is another important thing to consider for this. Since as we all know, the, uh, if you're going to be sending radio waves or electromagnetic radiation, it's going to reside somewhere in the spectrum and that has to be accounted for. But I would just ask, for folks that are interested in this to go ahead and, and take a look at NRL's website. It's just nrl.navy.mil, uh, November Romeo uh, Lima and .navy.mil. And, uh, yeah, we have a lot of videos, a lot of things that can inform folks about what we've been up to and where we're planning to go. So watch this space as we start to get results. I'm hopeful that, uh, we will have more to report. Very good. Well, that's uh, that's really cool, and it's, and it's cool that you got the uh, the LED up there on the space station to to demonstrate that. That's a, a great way to accomplish some some education there on on the antennas, and and I really like that idea. So good job on that, and and the whole thing. So best of luck with uh, the research and. Uh, if you find some some startling facts, why well, get back with us? We want to hear about that. Great, thank you, Neil. All right, that is a wrap for this week's edition of Ham Talk Live. Thanks to my guest, Dr. Paul Jaffe, KJ Four IKI, and everybody out there in cyberspace for listening and calling in and typing in, and invite you back next Thursday night. 9 p.m. Eastern Time. And for a list of all of our upcoming guests, visit hamtalklive.com. And if you like the show, please leave us a review. That helps others find us faster. So for now, this is Neil Rapp, WB9VPG, saying 7375. And as always, may the good DX be yours. Don't, 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 don't,